Hello. How's everybody doing tonight? Woo. Wow, all right. Doing great. So I just want to welcome everybody to the Science Pub, and thank you for coming. We really appreciate the support. Um, so this is just about the time where we've been, the new board has been doing this for a year now. So I just, I'm excited about that because we've been able to make this happen for such a long time. Everybody's still getting involved. Um, just want to let you know that, as always, the Science Pub is always a free event. We always want to make sure that it's free, but we do ask if you guys are willing and want to support us, we are asking for a $2 donation at the door. If you guys can help us out, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we also have begun to sell coffee mugs. It's a fundraising event. Fancy coffee mugs. Yeah, fancy, very fancy. So the Anchored Science Pub logo on the front, and then on the back is the caffeine molecule. So if you guys want to support us, we're asking $20 each. Yeah, it's, but it's for a fundraiser. We know, you know, but uh, thank you guys. One of the other things I wanted to mention is that we're always looking for new presenters. So if you have qualifications to do something on science related for the pub, please come talk to us. Also, if you know somebody, maybe write it down on the trivia sheet and their contact information and we'll get in touch with them and try and bring them up here in the future. The other thing I want to do is thank the Taproot. Uh, they let us have this venue for free, which is awesome. They have great food and we really appreciate the servers. They put a lot of work into helping you guys out, so please don't forget to tip. The other thing I want to mention is that we want to thank our sponsors. So Alaska Commons, uh, they're an online magazine. They do everything Alaska related. If you guys want to check them out online, that'd be great. They help us out with the website and several other things. So if you guys, yeah, support them by checking out their website. The other uh, sponsor is UAA. So they sponsor us by putting our events in their calendar and helping us to get a hold of potential presenters. And then uh, if you guys know somebody or an organization that is interested in sponsoring us, come talk to us because we'd love to make something happen with that. And then I just want to bring up uh, James with the trivia. Thank you guys. Tonight, Scott Michaelis, Marketing Director of Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Hi, guys. Thanks for having me tonight. really excited. We've started getting a lot of footage back from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game from the actual release. Um, so I've got quite a bit of footage to show you guys tonight that's just been released. Um, and then we'll make sure that I've got some time built in at the very end if anybody does have any questions. Um, but beforehand, I wanted to preface the Wildlife Center and the project for a little bit for those of you that may not be as uh, informed about the Wildlife Center or the wood bias and restoration. The Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center is a full 501c3 nonprofit organization. We've got our mission statement here on the screen. And me, uh, as James said, or excuse me, as Dan had mentioned, I'm the marketing director of the Wildlife Center. Uh, originally got my start as a lot of Alaskans came up for a 12 week job, and that somehow not turned into five years. Uh, <laughs> Spent quite a bit of time outside with a lot of the critters before I now found my way into a typical office job. Um, on the far right bottom corner, you'll see that is a baby moose, and then the picture I thought that was actually uh, that same moose as an adult. So as the animals got older, um, I was able to start working with some of the adults, had a brief uh, period in time where I was able to actually work hands-on with the Woodbison Project um, prior to again taking my spot in the office. Uh, originally opened in 1989 to the public, the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center was originally a for-profit company, Big Game Alaska. Uh, it took a little over a decade, and our 
uh, founder was able to buy out all the respective partners he had at the time. And over time, as it became his sole ownership of the property, it morphed into his sole vision of the facility. And in 2000, he officially applied for and was awarded the 501c3 educational nonprofit status, at which time we changed that to uh, better mimic and resemble the mission statement that I just showed on the previous slide. As a lot of you may know, we take care of the injured and orphaned wildlife of Alaska, and really surprises folks, but we actually don't own very many of the wildlife in our care. Um, brown bears, black bears, moose, muskox, eagles, owls, and very well known wood bison. Um, when the facility Big Game Alaska was first started, our founder brought up the small pod of plains bison, started working for and building his passion for the uh, larger species, and then several years later, uh, the Alaska Department of Fishing Game began a wooden bison project, at which point in time our facility became involved. Um, we had our wood bison herd for about 12 years prior to the release this past spring. They are a very close relative to the plains bison, but they do have some physical differences. Um, originally, they were both believed to be members of a master race known as the American Bison. American Bison ranged all over Alaska and better parts of Western Canada. Um, there was a distinct slit in the herd throughout the majority of the summer. And in short story, um, ended up uh, overlapping the breeding season. So the two uh, distinct subherds of the American bison had split for such a distinct period of time throughout the breeding season uh, that they slowly started to adapt to their respective environments. Uh, wood bison spent the majority of their years further north, plains bison further south, and then again, um, based on the respective environments that they occupy, they started to adapt to those respective environments. Um, a lot of the plains bison in the lower 48 states to the extended summer season, uh, the wood bison in the north to the extended winter season. We've got a significantly larger animal in the north. They also tend to be significantly darker in coloration. Uh, they've adapted so that the very little bit of sunlight we get in the middle of the winter season, they're able to absorb as much as possible, turning that into good energy for them. Um, they've also got extended tails. We tend to have pretty nasty biting bugs here, and they've essentially got the base and the best adapted fly swatter possible. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, they are a little bit larger. Wood bison are truly recognized as the largest animal in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, normal males tend to settle in around 2,000 pounds. However, historically, dominant male wood bison can reach as large as 3,000 pounds historically in the wild. Uh, their head and shoulders bigger than anything else that we've got. Um, very rarely get questions that the Wildlife Center to put that into context or a, a reference point for visitors. And honestly, those dominant males are in size car running around the enclosures. Um, some of those really big guys. Um, we've got one in the video a little later on that I was told on Friday by the project biologist that one specific male was just north of 2,500 pounds. Uh, here's the biggest snail that we released this past summer. Now again, very close relative. Uh, you can see some of the different adaptations there. Um, and if anybody is interested throughout the course of the night, a lot of this information was uh, pulled off of the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center's website and the website of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So if you're curious uh, as to any of this stuff, um, it's all listed for free there. And the Wildlife Center also has uh, free lesson plans and curriculum on this, if anybody's interested in any of that. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, wood bison historically ranged all over Alaska. That was a really significant part of this project. Um, we really did everything in our capacity to make sure that this wasn't labeled as an introductory effort. This was a reintroduction, bringing wood bison back to the state of Alaska, uh, a place where they had historically roamed uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of science behind the fact that moose are fairly recent to Western Alaska. Uh, we actually believe that moose are uh, as early as the last 100 years have just been introduced into Western Alaska. So historically, a lot of that Athabascan population survived on wood bison. Uh, simply put, the animal was more or less the food, the clothing, and the shelter for those populations for tens of thousands of years. 
one of the really neat things that the Department of Fish and Game started to find out after they began doing their habitat surveys in the 90s was that there was still a very active oral history among a lot of the native populations. Uh, 19, the very early 1900s in the United States, we started to publish findings that we had seen the last of our wood bison. Um, wood bison only ranged historically in Alaska, so as soon as Alaska published those findings, that was essentially the, the common point for the entirety of the U.S. Now, we're not sure when the last wood bison was lost, so the best idea that we have was the very early 1900s. Uh, the most recent skeletal we've been able to carbon date was um, believed to have been decimated uh, of passing as of the 1905, and that male was actually found in Chester Creek just north of Anchorage here. So it's a very recent extinction here in this state, so again, uh, a very recent active history of wood bison. Um, they had actually been placed on the extinction list formally in 1941 when the Canadian government also published similar findings. In the 1940s and then the early 1950s, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, as well as the Departments of Natural Resources in Canada, they adopted a lot of the airplane technologies. Uh, they started to use airplanes for aerial surveys and things of that nature to really get their hands around where some of these wild populations were. Um, it was shortly after having been on the extinction list for just over 17 years that two wildlife biologists were flying over remote parts of Alberta, Canada in the spy a small pod of bison and thought, oh, what if? That what if turned out to be some of the last genetically pure wood bison anywhere in the world. Uh, shortly thereafter, the Canadian government started their Wood Bison Recovery Act, and then about 40 years later, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game began the Wood Bison Restoration Project. I actually started with a number of wildlife biologists for the Department of Fish and Game out on a research survey in the field. Two gentlemen were overnight and while they were talking to one another they started to more or less think a lot about how some of the subjects and grasses could potentially support wood bison or bison in general. From there they began to further these discussions and they formally opened up uh, bigger research into it. It turned out that again not only were they able to find historical findings of wood bison in Alaska, archaeological findings, paleontological findings, but uh, again, they started to reach out to a lot of the uh, native communities and they found that this oral history was still very active. And again, after a lot of research surveys, they began the Wood Bison Restoration Project. In 2003, the state of Alaska brought their first 13 bison here to the state. As I mentioned earlier, the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center does not formally own any of the wildlife in our care. We've got a very unique partnership with the state of Alaska. The Wildlife Center down in Portage is a private nonprofit, so it's a very unique partnership between our small mom and pop nonprofit and the large state entity that is the Department of Fish and Game. Um, so we're more or less a caretaking facility on behalf of this state. Um, so if the Department of Fish and Game has found an animal that's injured or orphaned or a project that they're really trying to promote, they can in turn uh, utilize a captive facility such as ours. Uh, our public campus is a little over 200 acres, and then we also have an additional 135 acres of habitat just off of our public campus. So if there is a need to remove the human element, if you will, we can do that on the adjacent property down at uh, down in Portage. Mike Miller, our founder and now executive director, when he first opened up Big Game Alaska, actually had a small pod of plains bison. So he was somewhat familiar with the very large species, uh, started to work with some very large game at the time. Um, but when the Wildlife Center was incorporated in the Wood Bison Restoration Project, um, we had to up our game a little bit. Again, larger animals, um, more scientific research being done with the project, and there was also going to be a need to interact and engage with these animals, to do blood testing, to do all kinds of genetic samples, to run pregnancy assessments on some of the females. Uh, so in the very early portions of the 2000s, prior to the first uh, pod of bison brought to the wildlife center, we had this handling facility built. And if any of you are interested in agriculture, uh, the squeeze chute at the bottom of this slide is the largest cattle squeeze chute that's ever been built in the world. Uh, we own that one, and there's a second one in Western Canada at a Wood Bison National Park. 
So as I mentioned, in the 90s, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game began doing habitat surveys and things of that nature. Um, again, not only did they find out that there was a huge historical range here in the state of Alaska, but furthermore, there was still a good suitable habitat. Um, with an animal that's gone on the extinction list, if they've gone on the extinction list because the habitat's changed, uh, it's really going to limit any po possible or potential reintroduction. And if there's not a suitable habitat, it's going to be really difficult to release animals. Uh, the human element played a huge, significant port, uh, part of their uh, extinction or extirpation here in the state of Alaska. And for that reason, they provided a huge opportunity for humans to come in and again play a large role in the project. Essentially, we had an opportunity to go back and to right or wrong, if you will. Um, throughout the 90s, there were three separate areas of habitat that were designated by the Department of Fish and Game. The Lower Anoko and Yukon Rivers area was um, not only one of the better habitats that was found, but because of the amount of local support by Native villagers, um, that turned out to be um, not only the one that the Department of Fish and Game heavily recommended we utilize for release, but in turn actually was the site of habitat that we utilized for release. Um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game had to do a tremendous amount of work on this project. Uh, as soon as an animal is placed on the endangered species list, not only are they managed at a state level, but they're also going to be managed at a federal level, more or less you've got twice the amount of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, so throughout the decade-long process of approving wood bison for release, we had to jump through more or less twice as many hoops as typical projects would. Um, not to get too far into any of the politics, but one thing that I would say about the Endangered Species Act is that it does a really great job of preventing animal populations to get very low. However, it doesn't necessarily do the best job of rebuilding those populations back up. Um, in addition to the animals being protected, the land that they're on is very, very heavily protected. And for us here in Alaska, being a resource development state, that's obviously a huge issue. Uh, to not just protect the animals, but to just protect the habitat that they'd be released into. <clears throat> so it took about five years after this area had been labeled as a good source of habitat for bison that we were able to actually move forward. Um, one of the things that the Department of Fish and Game had to do was to get a management plan approved prior to release. They actually had 28 separate stakeholders present for every single different management meeting that they had. Um, it was everything from the Subsistence Hunting Board of Alaska, the federal government. Um, we had the conservationists, the preservationists, the extreme left, the extreme right, and just about everybody in the teams. Uh, pretty so it was pretty unbelievable that we were able to actually make progress that we made. Uh, 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 in May of 2014 was one of our final hurdles. Uh, part of the uh, species, uh, the uh, species, uh, the uh, species uh, there is a rule that we were able to receive uh, and approve uh, the, uh, the, 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 the 10J rule. The 10J rule. The 10J rule that we received uh, uh, again received in 2014 and 2015 provided us the opportunity to be able to and our own devices and the conservation center has been exposed and experiment so provided us the so opportunity, us the opportunity post to post-release to manage the so herd. If we, so if we say release the herd, say release the herd, and there was a uh, uh, that, that came forward, forward that came so forward, so we have reason to believe, have reason to believe that there may be feet of your wood bison. Yeah. We'd like uh, to host an exploratory, uh, exploratory, uh, uh, exploratory drill. Instead of, instead of, you know, we protect the habitat as well as the animals, as well as the animals, because the population is very well both experimental. As, as, um, as um, experimental and experimental, not essential, provided us the opportunity to still manage the animals and follow the release. So, should the state individual state be able to come forward and have the issue? We can now see the animals again instead of having to protect the habitat along with them. Now I've got a video that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning that was released by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, it goes over both of our release efforts. Um, simply put, our dominant males are so large that uh, financially as well as logistically, their release was going to be uh, almost entirely different. 
So this past spring, we released 100 females as well as sub-adults. They were flown out to the village of Shagalak. Uh, several months following, we were able to barge our males to the site of release. Uh, so they were shot some 700 miles before their journey down rivers. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of audio with the video, so I will do a little bit of talking throughout. Uh, but otherwise, this does a really good job of kind of overcapping both the project and then giving you some good detailed information on what actually happened this past summer. around the, in, the inner part of this circle, um, they start to lose sight of what part of the circle they're in, at which point in time we can open a series of external gates around the circle, and they'll start to run themselves from larger gated sections into much smaller confined scree shoots. Um, so this is them being led from the tail end of those um, wooden alleyways into the actual metal scree shoots that I had shown you before. this part of the process so many times that every individual member of this team was able to do without communicating with one another. Um, any source of stress or any opportunity for the animals to view our staff as predators or a potential source of predation can spook them to a point where they're not willing to move or budge in with an animal well over 2,000 pounds and they're the ones making the decisions that they can make. Um, those shots that you saw were the last rounds of dewormer and vitamins that we were able to give them prior to their release. And now they've, uh, their final one is fitting up the collars and then they'll take their last blood samples prior to them um, flying out. And this part of the video looks kind of hard, but that's actually for the animal safety as well as uh, that's the state of Alaska's veterinarian right there, Bob Gerlach. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, a tremendous number of stakeholders present. And just that one shot was Alaska's representative on behalf of Fish and Game, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, and a number of other groups and organizations. you're curious how we got the largest land animal in the Western Hemisphere into small Connex trailers for transport, um, this is about to walk you through it. And the uh, Connex trailers, the quote-unquote bison boxes, if you will, uh, I can answer some questions on those later, but we had all of those Connex trailers specially fabricated here in town so that uh, we could accommodate the huge device and all the way down to the small juveniles. Um, they all had interchangeable doors, so you'll see a series of numbers on them. Uh, to give you an idea of the size, we were able to fit as many as three dominant bowls into one container, as many as 13 adult females into one container, and potentially as many uh, as 20 juveniles. 
uh, regardless of gender per container. terrible reference, but almost an enormous toaster with um, upwards of 20 individual slices of bread. <laughs> together. So in addition to being very, very neat connex trailers, they were built in positions that any two of them could fit together like the biggest, most unique puzzle pieces you could imagine. And they were loaded at the Anchorage International Airport and flown into Chandler. In addition to being a good area of habitat, having a tremendous amount of support from the villagers, Shagalop was one of the very few villages in Alaska that could support a C-130 Hercules aircraft. And their landing strip was just a little bit too small, so we actually had to do it in the middle of winter when the runway was good and frozen, so we were able to provide ourselves some additional room. The Department of Transportation, getting equipment into some of these villages was next to impossible, and so there was a lot of begging, borrowing, and stealing on behalf of DOT to get some of those parts and pieces and equipment available to us. Actually, now out in Shagla. Uh, the first 100, as I mentioned, were the females and sub-adults. They were our greatest priority getting out there. Um, not only do bison herds tend to be matriarchal, but also um, it goes a tremendous distance in the way of developing a home habitat if we were able to get our females out in advance of birthing season. So again, they were our greatest priority to get them out at the end of March, early April, in advance of the birthing season. And because we needed them to develop that site as a good source of habitat, um, they went through what we call a soft release. So they were flown out into Shagalak, released into these temporary enclosures where they were allowed to acclimate to their new surroundings, join back up together as a herd. So as soon as the 100th member of this initial release were flown out together, that's what kick-started the two-week acclimation process. And you'll see some of them come out rather slow, some of them come out like a bullet out of a gun. Um, they're very unique animals. Each one of them has an individual set of uh, personalities and traits and things of that nature, so they're very unique. Uh, both your males and your females will have horns. Uh, your males' horns tend to be uh, built for more aggressive purposes, your females for more defensive purposes. Your males Horns, for that reason, tend to grow out and out more symbolic or typical of the Texas Longhorn, uh, whereas uh, a lot of your females' horns will be very closely curled into the head, almost resembling that of a crescent moon. We, uh, we didn't. Um, so they've all been ear tagged, and that was our way of distinguishing the individual members of the herd. As a little bit of a joke, the last few years we had them in captivity, all of our big bulls um, have the acronym Bob. 
<laughs> a big, a big old bull. I'm not so joking. Bob 24 and Bob 35. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we had to do is very critical for the project. The last month that they spent in captivity, uh, we developed these two areas at the Conservation Center campus where after hours, after we closed down to the public, we would need them from one enclosed space to another through a very small alleyway. So essentially we were training them to be moved in a small corridor, if you will. We moved them from pasture A to pasture B every night for about a month prior to their release. And then following um, being flown out to Shagalock, we had two temporary enclosures for them to go into, and we did the same thing throughout that two weeks of acclimation. After uh, the day of the day they'd spend, they'd be led from the next temporary enclosure back and forth by an individual. And then we built that alleyway there across the frozen Anoka River, and what they were dropping out in advance was actually feces. So it's really important for the animals that they've got a, a good idea of the area that they're going into to feel safe, to feel comfortable. Uh, so we do have some alfalfa. As you can see off of the back of the snow machine, that's a preferred food source for bison. Uh, but more or less, they were just trained to be led over that last month. And we did absolutely make sure our project biologists had a brand new ski snow machine complex in the last and uh, you'll see here in a few minutes why it was absolutely essential that that snow machine was brand new and working properly. <laughs> and if you're curious, that fencing, that alleyway that we used, uh, was nothing more than a visual barrier. Uh, they were held up by sticks, and if a single one of those animals would have tested, the entire thing would have gone down. They're actually fairly intellectual. You'll see some very distinct and clear herd dynamics here, even as they're moving as a group of 100 animals. You'll see certain sized animals at certain parts of the group. As you can see, there's a little bit of a lull in the middle of the group. A lot of the smaller animals were forced into the middle. And they've been trained to follow the snow machine, so you'll see the biologist now take off and go quite a bit faster because he was going slow enough that they started to zigzag behind him and wind up the river. But they are going over the frozen Anoko River right now. Uh, you'll see the bank of the river in just a second here. And as soon as they get up and over that part of the bank, there is some food that was laid out there again. They were meant to believe that they were being led from one small enclosure to the other. But this is the bank of the river, and this is the first time uh, right here that wood bison were technically considered a wild animal again in the United States for the first time in the last century. something like 20 tons of moisturized haylage and food sources flown out for our females and juveniles, but one of the things that caught us most off guard was how quickly they started to resemble a wild animal. Um, within just a matter of days, they were feeding off natural food sources and didn't rely on any of the artificial food sources or diet that we typically use in captivity. Now these are the dominant bulls here, and again, they were so much larger that not only were we having to do them in the summer, but some of our bulls were so big that they wouldn't fit into the largest squeeze chute in the world. This is our project biologist, Tom Seaton, from the Department of Fish and Game. And we actually had several males that were so big that we had to dart them in the field and physically and manually move them into their bison boxes or their containers. So this will walk you through a little bit of the process of loading the male. We also picked early June because it was supposed to be a nice and cool start to the summer. However, the select days that we were able to utilize the barge, we had record temperatures down in Portage, and this specific day we had, uh, I believe, briefly touched 85 degrees. 
And one thing that's become increasingly apparent is at the Wildlife Center, a lot of our staff members don't have the best looking legs. It's the the better part of the year. And in another minute here, you'll see uh, one male in particular, ear tag 250. Bob or Big Old Bull 250 was the largest male that we moved throughout the process. And again, he was just slightly bigger than 2,500 pounds. Um, so just to, again, as a frame of reference, uh, some of the largest bears that we've ever been able to record in Alaska are, are in the ballpark of about 1,500 pounds. So this, um, again, Bob, 250 was well over a thousand pounds bigger than some of the largest bears ever recorded here in the state. <laughs> the females are moved in white marks, so we were able to use those hood scoops to force air into their containers. Uh, with the males, again, being in the summer, we physically had to attach air conditioners to their units to be able to move them at safe temperatures. If you can remember back to the beginning of this last summer, Alaska was actually dealing with quite a few unique things. Um, we had a number of forest fires, so on and so forth, and we actually had to have a, a trooper escort up to Nanam because they had to go through so many of the burn sites and things of that nature, and they needed to continue physically forcing air inside the containers for the animals. If they stopped any one of the trucks, it would have uh, potentially been fatal to the animals, so they began Specifically, um, when they had scouted out the Anoko River several days in advance, where they were going to be able to uh, drop off the males um, between several days prior to when they actually were able to disembark and release the males, uh, the river had dropped something like eight to ten feet within those few days. So the areas that they had come back to were completely different, and uh, in a span of something like 45 minutes to two hours, they had to. Um, build that ramp up and cut all that brush away and a couple of those trees by hand. in total between trucking and flight time, uh, each individually spent upwards of about six hours in their containers. The males, on the other hand, spent the better part of about four and a half days in theirs. So as you can see, they're quite a bit more hesitant when they are actually being released. Uh, but one of the unique bits about the males 
Uh, again, as I had mentioned, the, the females would be the, the group leaders. Uh, they very much matriarchal in the way that they build their herds. So with the males, we were able to actually perform what we call a hard release, get them out into the wild, and you can more or less open up the door, and there they go. Slides and updates for you guys, and then uh, we can turn it over if anybody's got any questions. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, there were three original areas of habitat that were designated by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game through their habitat surveys in the early and mid-90s. Uh, this area of habitat specifically was the one that, again, we ended up using. Um, we used to reference the Gash District, and it was more or less this area of habitat in between the villages of Grayling, Anvik, uh, Shagaluk, and Holy Cross. And in the top right corner, we'll give you a small map of where within the state of Alaska that is. Uh, the area of release was roughly 300 miles due west of Anchorage. Now that same picture regarding that area of habitat uh, in those two vertical images is going to more or less be that blue designated area. Uh, so this is a really neat map, and this is one that just got released to us, and it's in some of the uh, print updates that were at the front door. Um, but on the left-hand side, that's going to be the female map, and on the right-hand side, that's going to be the male map. Um, as you may have seen in the video or here in this picture, um, all the animals that we released this past year had all been collared. Uh, it ended up being a function of funding, and the majority of the collars we ended up using were radio and not satellite. Um, again, nonetheless, 130 of the members were all collared prior to their release. <coughs> Unfortunately, we've ended up losing a fair number of collars off of our males. Um, for the first time in recent history, they've had an opportunity to figure out who gets a chance to breed with which girls. And there's been quite a bit of additional rut behavior out in the wild. Um, having those big bulky necklaces on, uh, they've had a few pop off inadvertently. Um, sorry. Um, but no, we've been able to pull really good information nonetheless. Um, one of the things I had mentioned earlier, and it's really um, a great example here on these maps is how quickly they started to mimic and resemble wild animals. Um, in the map on the left, as you can see there, there's five different circles. Uh, one of the big distinctions between woods bison and plains bison is the number in which they like to build or grow their herds. With plains bison, they can potentially grow into herds, hundreds if not thousands of animals, iconic herds like you uh, see in dances with wolves. Um, whereas with wood bison, they really like to group up in uh, numbers of 15 to 45 typically. And because of that, when we released 100 animals initially, we were very curious again to see how much time it would take before those animals started to really mimic or resemble wild animals. And within just a matter of days, we had five distinct subgroups uh, build themselves. And now throughout the better part of the summer, and we have five separate groups that we were able to follow. Uh, we had several of them coming together for the breeding season, and now we've had a few more come together uh, throughout the winter, which is fairly common, but again, just a matter of days before they really started to mimic and resemble wild animals. Um, that map on the left is really neat. So not only is it obvious and evident that the females and their newborns were very keen on uh, exploring their new areas of habitat, 
Um, but one of the things that's very, very positive for us that follow the project is that as soon as they got to the outer reaches of that good premium habitat, again, that premium habitat uh, designated by that blue outline, and as soon as they got to the outer reaches of that habitat, instinctively they started to turn back. So they're starting to really understand where that good premium habitat is. Um, and again, they're able to stick to it. That means a tremendous amount for their survival. On the right hand side is the males that we release later on in the summer. Very common for your breeding age males to stay in the general vicinity of your females and their herds. However, your juvenile males and your very uh, older male herd members tend to be fairly solitary. They understand there's not a lot of opportunity for breeding, so they tend to lead a fairly isolated lifestyle. Um, at one point in time this past summer, we were actually recording uh, several wood bison that had something like 900 miles of habitat in between them. At uh, one point in time, we had several uh, adolescent males go significantly farther north of the release site than we were expecting. And at the same point in time, we had some of the females explore uh, some of the uh, southernmost reaches of the habitat. <coughs> we also uh, recorded a small group of females and a couple of juveniles swimming across a section of the Yukon River. <coughs> The section of the river that they swam across uh, was actually a little bit longer than a half mile wide. Uh, so they've been doing extraordinarily well. Uh, the calving season last spring went really well. The breeding season this fall went really well. Uh, unfortunately, we did lose a few animals uh, between that ice as well as just adapting to the natural elements. Um, in captivity, you take care of the very old, the very young, the weak, and the sick. Uh, Mother Nature doesn't tend to be quite as forgiving. Um, but that's a lot of what I had. Um, do you guys want to go over the trivia questions now? Sure. Question answers. Question answers. Yes, ma'am. How many are left of the 130? Um, of the 130 that we released. <clears throat> and again, I had an opportunity to speak with our project biologist on Friday, so this is very up to date. Um, between last spring, this past summer, and now this fall, we've lost a total of 19 animals in the wild. How many cats? And how many cats? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so the question was how many have we lost as well as gained? Um, we believe we gained around 20 calves. Um, one of the tricky things about the calves is that we released them prior to their calving um, and we didn't want to go out and sedate them simply for the fact of collaring. Um, so we believe we've got somewhere in the ballpark of about 20 calves and we had a confirmed 19 fatality. So we're still a little bit on the plus side. This is the first year. Uh, and moving forward, we expect something like a 20% growth on an annual basis. Uh, yes? Just to some of the areas in the uh, extreme far-reaching west. Oh, okay, gotcha. And I'm just kind of curious if you can talk a little bit more about that as far as sure. how they change the ecology and why they move in. Sure. Um, and that's actually a really great point. Um, so there hasn't, in the absence of bison, really been a species that has come in to fill that void. Um, a lot of people want to point at moose, but they're very, uh, very different animals between what they eat, the way that they forage, uh, the way that they interact even with other species. Um, wood, the wood bison are grazers. Um, they've got that enormous plumage of hair because they will literally use it like a dust mop. Uh, they tend to live in sections of the state that get the extreme cold, but they don't tend to get the extreme snow depth. Um, areas of Alaska that can fairly regularly hit 50 to 60 below in the middle of winter. Um, and again, they'll literally use their face um, and that extreme hair that they grow to dust away the little bit of snow to get back down to uh, good sedges and grasses. Whereas with moose, the way that their bodies are built, they stay above the snow line. They'll continue to eat and pick out a lot of the vegetation and growth on trees and bushes. Um, they fill a good niche. Um, even in comparison with animals like caribou, they, they fill their own separate section of the ecosystem. So it's largely been a portion of the ecosystem that's been absent for the last century. Um, there's a research piece that just came out about what the potential wood bison wallows could mean to, to species in Alaska. And apparently there's 
wallows that could potentially support upwards of a thousand different species between microorganisms all the way down. Um, and I'm sorry, I forget what your other question. Uh, the, the experimental designation. Yeah, so the experimental designation is more closely tied to the size of their population in the wild. And since their population in the United States is very, very small and limited, um, that's what caused us to utilize that designation. We're hoping that as their population is able to grow and build, instead of utilizing a different rule within the endangered species list, we're actually hoping that we can delist them. Um, so there wouldn't be that same need to be both protecting them as well as their habitat. Um, and one of the things, interestingly enough, that we're able to do in the United States because of our close relationship with Canada is we can actually use a lot of their numbers. So um, if there is an effort to delist wood bodies and on the endangered species list here in the United States, um, there's only six existing herbs right now, the five in the wild and then the one down at the Conservation Center for the United States. Um, but currently, we estimate that there's something like 10,000 wild wood bison in Canada over the last 45 years that they've been breeding and releasing. Um, they've got something like two to 4,000 in captive facilities in Canada as well, so uh, we're able to utilize the numbers that they have in Canada to prove that they're not a threatened animal by any means and they're doing quite well in the wild. So if we're able to potentially delist them, uh, then that would potentially uh, remove designations like non-essential or, or an experimental population. Yes, ma'am. How much per bison? How much per bison? How much was spent per bison? 130 bison. To release them back into the wild? Yes. Um, I didn't see any of the final financials on the 30 males that we did this summer. I know the 30 males were much, much cheaper than the females. Um, flying versus barging. Last numbers I had seen on our females and our juveniles was something between 1.25 and 1.3 million dollars. Each? No, excuse me, that was project total for those first uh, 100 animals. So whatever that would have been divided up by 100. And then again, I'm not sure uh, specifically about that second group. Um, the state of Alaska stir first started working on the project. Uh, they only allocated funds for 30 animals to go out. That's what the state was going to put into the project. Uh, the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center, as a private nonprofit, was able to fundraise the rest of it. So not only were we able uh, to send out an initial 100 animals, uh, but all the equipment, all the food, and then um, some of the larger machinery uh, was taken care of on behalf of the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center. Uh, we had tremendous partners throughout the project. Uh, Linden Air Cargo, uh, Steel Fab with the Connexes, um, Bass Pro Shops, Safari Club International. Uh, Safari Club International actually uh, made such a large contribution that that contribution alone probably represented an additional 50 or 60 animals we were able to release into the wild. Uh, so they contributed a, a, an extraordinary amount to the project. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, so with uh, regards to which one do you want to do first? <laughs> um, as far as the hunting goes, uh, yeah, the, the hope is to eventually build the population to such a point where there could potentially be a harvest. Um, right now in the management plan, it looks like the only real potential for hunt in the next five to ten years would be a ceremonial take on behalf of some of those native communities. Uh, one of the rough numbers I've heard thrown around is a herd size of about 400. Um, until the herd hits 400, they're not going to really be viewed as self-sustaining. There will be a certain degree of assistance on behalf of the Department of Fish and Game that will be provided. Uh, right now, the Department of Fish and Game um, tracks, monitors, and spends time on the field every other or every third day with the animals, so there's still a tremendous amount of management being done. Um, again, once the herd gets to about 400, then they can be viewed as self-sustaining to a certain degree, and then there'd be potential for larger hunts to be discussed. Um, again, the hope is that we can potentially build their population to such a point where they could sustain a harvest. Um, but any larger hunt, anything above a ceremonial take would be a number of years away. And I'm sorry, what was your second question? Predation? Yeah. 
Um, so right now we have every question. Yeah, so the question was uh, with regards to predation, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what we expect to see for predation in the wild. You know, it's, it's really not. And uh, one of the things that we were very fortunate in is that we've been able to study the uh, release and introductory efforts that have been taking place in Canada over the last 40 some years. Uh, we actually have every expectation that we could see upwards of two decades before our first successful sign of predation in the wild. Um, they go to such extreme lengths to not only protect the young and the old, but the sick and the weak. The herd mentality of wood bison is, is extraordinary, to say the least. Um, again, both your males and your females will grow and develop horns. Um, and another big thing that they have going for them is um, to they're the largest land animal in the Western Hemisphere, and they've been out of the natural environment for the last 100 years plus. So. A lot of animals won't be able to threaten the size that they possess, and the few animals that could, uh, your, your tundra wolves would, would probably be your uh, most common expected predator. They're so much larger, and they've been outside of the natural environment for so long that a lot of your tundra wolves just simply won't know what to do with them. Um, so again, we have every expectation that we should see close to the next two decades before our first successful hunts in the wild. Yes, sir. What are your long-term objectives, 50, 100 year, in terms of population and dispersion? Um, that's a good question. and um, I'll only be able to speak on behalf of a small part of that. Um, a lot of the project at this point now that we're back in the wild is, is back kind of in the lap of the Department of Fish and Game. Um, there are several other additional sites of habitat that have been tossed around as potential areas of release. Um, there's two additional sites of habitat right now that um, we'd love to move forward with. Uh, right now, there's so much involved with maintaining the existing herd and following the existing herd and studying how well they do that there's not any plans uh, in place for a second or a third potential release. Um, Furthermore, we're not sure if we'd be able to even utilize a new site of habitat. There's a very high likelihood that if there is an, another uh, ranger after effort, we'll uh, simply uh, release back into the Anoko, um, assisting the herd that's now in place outside of Shagaluk. Um, the hope is to be able to get them to a point where um, we can get them back to their historical levels, where they were thriving here in the state of Alaska and had very huge healthy populations that could potentially represent an extraordinary amount to us Alaskans culturally, the uh, potential for food, for clothing, for shelter, to potentially get them back to a point where uh, they mean as much to us as they once did in the state. I, it's probably not the, the cleanest answer, but that's, that's the point we'd like to get them back to, to really build that population back to a point where it can be viewed as a wild animal that doesn't need the oversight of the management on behalf of the state. Would that be thousands? There's, there's absolutely potential for that. Um, the Inoko area where we release them in, that one site of habitat has the potential to easily support over a thousand bison. Um, the, the biggest area of habitat that was designated in all those aerial surveys uh, was the Yukon Flats. Um, right now, there's a fair amount of opportunity for um, resource development in Yukon, and that was one of the big reasons why Yukon wasn't pursued. Um, but that area of habitat alone has the potential <coughs> to support upwards of 10,000 bison. Uh, so there's huge, huge potential for the bison back in the state of Alaska. All right, I guess one or two more questions, and we can move forward. Yes, ma'am. Um, a big part of it was very similar to the Plains Bison or 48, the, the human involvement. Uh, people coming up to the state over hunting. Um, and one of the big things was the hunting technology. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, not only were people coming up here to the state, but the technology they were bringing with them was so much more over what it had historically been, that there was not only potential to take bison, but to take them at record numbers. Um, again, very similar to the way that the prairie or the plains bison numbers 
um, driven to such extreme points in the early 1900s. Uh, here in Alaska, it just kind of wanted an additional step when we lost the last of ours. down at the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center. Uh, right now we're hoping to continue breeding and building our numbers to support a, a, an additional reintroductory effort. Uh, right now we're slowly shifting our focus from breeding the existing animals we have in place um, and we're hoping to start exchanging genetics with a couple facilities in western Canada so we can uh, diversify our gene pool that we have for wood bison and then that could potentially support um, a secondary release effort in the next several years. Yes, ma'am, I'll take this as my last one. And then I'll make sure, um, I'll hang around afterwards if anybody else has any questions that they'd uh, like to ask. I'm more than happy to hang around as long as you guys uh, have interest. But yeah, go ahead. Ma'am. That's a really good question. Um, they're, they're both very close relatives. Um, wood bison are a little bit closer in natural size and in uh, some of the expected behaviors that they could have possessed. Now, step or American bison have been gone for so long that at this point it's quite a bit of a guessing game. Um, but they're close enough, there's still absolutely uh, a clear, distinct link. Um, the woods bison and the plains bison are such close relatives that one of the biggest things that actually went into the areas of release was the potential for hybridized offspring. Uh, they are, there are plains bison here in the state of Alaska, so in addition to physical proximity with, with humans and other animals and villages, one of the other things that went into that was proximity to plains bison. Um, again, there was a huge amount of concern with the potential hybridized offspring of the two and uh, the potential that they may not fit particularly well into either respective environment you kind of have an anomaly of an offspring. Thank you guys so much again. And if anybody has any questions, please, Scott, I'm more than happy to answer any of your guys' questions. But thanks so much for listening and hope you guys have a great night.